Super. I can't wait to introduce you to our next guest. Uh, you're so lucky to be here today. <laughs> Following that rich, beautiful conversation, <clears throat> we get to learn from, work with, and be in relation to uh, one of the most singular and outstanding voices in American theater today. Heather Raffo has taken such care with us in the way that she's sh showed up to be a part of this event. We've learned so much in our preparation with her. She's taught us already before she's even formally taken the stage. She has been named by The New Yorker as an example of how art can remake the world. She's one of the people who has forged the genre of Arab American theater. She spent her career writing and embodying <clears throat> the stories of Iraq. And it is such a generous offer for her to be with us today. Please welcome Heather Raffo. Thank you. It is great for me to be here at my alma mater <laughs> as we collectively look to uplift the human in human enterprise. And thank you. I also want to thank Stacy for mentioning um, safe space because um, my hope is that this is a safe space for all of us and we're going to do some kind of interactive writing exercises, which I know is really strange for a business conference. But um, before we do that, I want to tell you a bit about myself and my work. So as a theater artist, my work is centered in the human story. And as an Iraqi American, my artistry lives at the intersection of grief and gratitude, upheaval and uplift. So what I am, what I do is tell stories, but what I am is a bridge builder and I've been bridging cultures since I was born. A little background on B. I was born in Michigan to an Iraqi immigrant father and a mother with German-Irish heritage who grew up in Battle Creek. My mother was the first in her family to go to university, and my dad was the first in his family to leave Iraq. They were in love and married for 53 years, so I am the physical embodiment of their care, their differences, and their hope. I'm also the first generation Iraqi American born in the only time in history those countries have been at war. So I cannot escape grief and gratitude, upheaval and uplift. Whether I'm working across theater, opera, or film, the core of my work has always been to find and uncover the aspects of the human story that are not easy to speak, but that are essential to hear. And this work has taken me into conversations across all kinds of borders, on main stages and in migrant communities, in the military and in the Middle East. And what I discovered to be true is that the intimate art of sharing one's story inspires empathy and brings diverse communities together. But its lasting value is in helping us embrace our true collective potential. So it's a bit like this room. What we're doing today is closer to theater than any other art form, right? It's live and it's communal. We're sitting here amidst people we don't know with our individual aspirations, hoping to have a communal experience. Except the human story we're exploring, I don't want to only happen on the stage, I want it to happen within ourselves. So together we're gonna carve out a very private moment in this public space to explore some writing exercises I've developed in communities and classrooms across the world. Now, a private moment means whatever you write in your program is for you and you alone. You don't have to share it. If you choose to share later, that's up to you. My hope is that it just inspires how you bring yourself into the room. My hope is that you discover a story that you didn't expect to be relevant at a conference but a story that makes you more available to each other. Stories about where we come from and what we carry and how we bring the human to human enterprise because I know none of us 
are a stranger to grief and gratitude, upheaval and uplift. So if you could open your programs to page 21, you'll see that there, and the same is, is true for our online participants in your online program. On page 21, you'll see some um, empty writing pages that have been left there for you. The first prompt says, what's in a name? If you could write, grab a pen. We're doing it the old fashioned way. <laughs> pen and paper, just like a writer does. And my first question to you is, what is your name? Can you write your name there, your full name? Your first, your middle, if you have multiple middle names, your last name, maiden name, married last name. So my full name is Heather Lynn Raffo. Heather means a rugged mountain flower, usually from Ireland. Lynn is a Celtic lake. And Raffo, I have been told, is the Iraqi name for the Archangel Raphael. So I, uh, my parents, I know, discussed both Arabic and English names for me in case we lived in Iraq, but we, we lived here. But it's really my mother who named me because she was in love with historic novels and read about the heather on the hills of Ireland. And I think that's really beautiful because my mother had never left the country before marrying an Iraqi immigrant. So I think in naming me Heather, she was connecting to a heritage and a history of her own. So my question to you is who named you and what does each of your names mean? I'm gonna give you a little time to write that in that space. Who named you and what does each of your names mean? I know you might not know what some of your names mean. If you know what one of them means, write it down. The next question is, how is your name a web of relationships to people, place, and history? So obviously, as an Iraqi American, my name itself is a web of relationships between the East and the West and between Iraq and America. But this guy, the second guy on the right with the dark um, headdress on, is my great-great-grandfather, Rafo. Right? And Rafa was his first name. His last name was El Nakar, which meant the carvers. We were marble carvers, and people's last name used to be um, their trade. But when they moved from the villages to the big city of Mosul, in an attempt to modernize, they dropped the last name El Nakar. And since that time, we've been Rafos. Um, but as an Iraqi Christian, we also hail from the Babylonians and Sumerians. So I feel like that name Rafo, you know, symbolizes something as ancient as the cradle of civilization, but also this attempt to modernize. So how is your name a web of relationships to people, place, and history? I'm going to give you a few moments to write. Perhaps your name carries religious significance or you were named after someone important in your family. How is your name a web of relationships to people, place, and history?
just so you know, I'm going to give you about two minutes to answer these questions because I know you're looking at me. Some of you are looking at me. Don't worry, I got the timer. In my writing classes, I tell the students, you just don't pick your pen up. You just keep going and see what comes. You think you answer it in a direct way, but it's really the thing you find about a minute later that's really interesting, coming from the subconscious. Next question is, what do you uplift in the web of relationships that make up your name? So this is a photo of my parents on the day they got engaged. <laughs> so I obviously uplift their love and how deeply they uplifted each other. But I also uplift that both their families were so generous about this marriage and about getting to know each other, where there could have been impassable cultural divides. There was only generosity and love. So I really felt I got to belong to two cultures. What do you uplift in the web of relationships that makes up your name? Hi, people upstairs. I just noticed people upstairs. <laughs> Hello. It's so great. People on the sides. There's people over here, too. Oh, hello. That's so unfair. I got to start standing in the middle. <laughs> OK. The next question is, where is there upheaval in the web of relationships that makes up your name? Where is there upheaval in the web of relationships that make up your name? So um, there's lots of upheaval and uprooting in my recent family history, because I had um, over 100 immediate family members in Iraq when the war started in 2003. And now I have only two cousins left in the country. The rest are scattered across four continents. So my, we were from Iraq for thousands of years, and we have literally scattered in 10. So that's where I place that upheaval. But upheaval can also just be that a family member changed their name to assimilate or accommodate. Or maybe the upheaval in your name is you're named after someone you don't like. So where is there upheaval in the web of relationships that makes up your name?
So this is a picture that's actually my grandfather and grandmother in the front and all my aunts and uncles in the back. <laughs> so your name has traveled far, and I imagine you have too. The next question is, what did it take to get here today? Travel, childcare, education, breaking the glass ceiling. There should be a picture of my husband and two kids here because he's the one holding down the fort so I can be here today, but my teenage daughter refused to have her photo anywhere. So just imagine it. That's what it took for me to be here today, right? I know you all can understand. What did it take you to get here today? What did it take generations for you to accomplish? So this is a photo of my mom and my grandfather, and obviously the dog too. Um, it says off to college. I can't, there, there was a date. Oh, I think it's 59. Um, so my mom, as I mentioned, was the first in her family to go to university, and my dad was also the first in his family to go to university. But my grandfather was the first to get accepted to university. So he was accepted, and he had a football scholarship, and then in his first semester, he broke his back and couldn't play and lost his scholarship and then became a car salesman. And this story all his life was how he regretted not going to university. So I say it took generations for me to be educated. It took generations for me to be educated, and education was just the, the, um, the prize of our family. It was what they, both sides of the family wanted. So what did it take generations for you to accomplish? Who blazed the trail that you now follow or further?
Next question is, how are you living your ancestors' wildest dreams? I think for me, it's the fact that I can travel across borders and continents with ease. I think I'm the first woman in anybody in my family tree that has lived a number of years on her own in a city far away from where I was born. The fact that I can even stand on stage and speak <coughs> the intimate thoughts of my heart. Nobody in my family ever dared to stand on stage. They didn't feel safe being seen. How are you living your ancestors' wildest dreams? Some of you will recognize that Flint mural, those of you from Flint. And again, that's my grandma and my grandfather and some of my aunts and uncles. My dad's not there yet. He's not born yet. I'll say it's also really moving for me to stand here under a picture of my grandmother <laughs> and grandfather with her braids. And, you know, she was married at 14. And here, here I am, not married at 14. This <laughs> is really good, right? You know, I feel their presence. That's really, it's really powerful. The next question is, who uplifts you? And who do you need to acknowledge? Um, when I was in my junior year at University of Michigan in 1990, it, the first Iraq war broke out, and I was pretty shaken and afraid. Um, and I didn't feel I had anyone to turn to, but my fellow group of theater students, who pretty much knew nothing about Iraq, just leaned in and listened and had conversations full of nuance, and they kept checking in on me. They are my best friends to this day. So I uplift them and the journey we had together, that we didn't have to understand exactly where each other came from or what it was about. We just had to show up for each other. Who uplifts you? And who do you need to acknowledge? I also want to acknowledge that my identity 
has been shaped by the uprooting of my family from a place they lived for thousands of years, but that my opportunities are shaped by the uprooting of the indigenous communities that lived here for thousands of years. So I carry those in my heart. If you could now take your name tag, I want you to write the name of someone who uplifts you or someone you need to acknowledge as being instrumental to who you are today on this line below your name. So that as you go through the conference, perhaps you share the story of this person that uplifted you because none of us got here alone. So it's right on your name tag. There's a line below your name. And for our online participants, there's a question that says, who do you need to acknowledge? If you could put that name in there. You might have done so already, but that would be great. Now, you're also going to find in your name tag a secret card. It's folded because it's top secret. It's what are you carrying today? So we're going to write on this card what we're carrying today, and it's top secret. Nobody's ever going to see it, right? But that's something you walked in the room with that's likely too personal to share, something very close to your heart something impossible to let go of, a grief, a pressure, a fear. This is my dad who's passed away of Alzheimer's. I'm just, I'm just, I'm sharing my top secret with you guys. Um, but it's not only he's passed and I carry him, but I'm really carrying my mother who now is alive but has Alzheimer's. So that's what I'd be writing on my card. Um, if you could just write what you're carrying today on your card and then fold it up top secret, and put it back in your lanyard. And the hope is that as we move through this time of upheaval and uplift, that we want what you carry to live a little closer to your name and your business and your brand. And as we explore the human in human enterprise, recognize that each of us carries a world of things very close to our heart. Now I want to create a little upheaval in the room itself because, you know, you're all facing forward toward a single authoritative voice, which seems very silly. I want you instead to turn to each other, find someone you don't know, and instead of introducing your name, share something about the story of your name. Right? Share something about the story of your name and something that you learned or that surprised you about what you carry, where there's upheaval or uplift in your life. You don't have to share anything top secret, but just share something, right, with someone you don't know. We've got 10 minutes in this room for that sharing before we break out into other rooms. And for our online participants, I just want to say that you can go into your networking rooms in the left control bar, select groups, then enter any networking room called the story of your name. And these rooms will be open for 30 minutes. Thank you.